Well, okay. Hello, everybody. I'm David Gross with Condi Systems, back with you to share a little bit of our secrets of success. And today I have one of the fantastic friends of mine. Uh, Dane, how long have we known each other? Ooh, man, long time. Long Maybe 18 time. years or so. So Dane and I travel the, the country. Um, and of course, we're not doing a whole lot of traveling right now. So as Dane said, we're staring at a computer. And um, Dane is one of the, I would say, I don't uh, know what to call you. You're not a Cajun, of course, uh, uh, but you are from I Louisiana. Am, but a little bit of a work Cajun. for a living, though. <laughs> but I was going to tell you, the Cajun of artwork. Um, and uh, Dane is just known around the world for, for his artwork. And in fact, um, Dane and our Doug DeWitt um, sort of, partnered a little bit on this book, Dane, and um, yeah. I, I'm sure we'll get to talk about it here, but I want to welcome you to our webinar today, and um, I'm not going to be too good at the, the questions. I apologize, so Sprite's going to help me out as we get questions in, but Dane, what we're here today, of course, is, is to educate. I mean, when we talk about um, the, the sort of the secret sauce, the secret of success in, in graphics, you cover more, more markets than, than I can even say in a few minutes. Um, but, it, but it's all about, you know, making products that people want. And so, Dane, tell us, what is your part in this? What do you do to help people be successful? Right, perfect. No, so um, what I do is I... I, I one my most favorite thing that I do do is teach people uh, how to get the best out of their artwork, how to get the best out of their out of Photoshop Illustrator. Uh, I do some Corel Draw training, um, not a lot because I don't live in Corel every day. Uh, but what we what I do uh, like to convey and want to tell people is, if you're going to work with photos, right? Photographic style artwork, raster artwork, pixel based um images you should be working in photoshop even if you're a corel draw user and i know corel draw has a their own little image adju uh, uh, adjustment software called corel photo paint that comes with the suite which is great um, but it's not the industry standard it's not where everybody is uh, if you're going to grow your art department for instance you want to hire some kid out of school uh, that guy's or girl they're going to know adobe illustrator and photoshop that's what's taught in schools. Um, so right there, you would have not that you wouldn't have to train anybody to work uh, on anything. Yeah, my um, version. I started with Photoshop three and uh, grew up with it. I'm a good cut and paste artist. I have no artistic talent, so I'm always amazed. But you're 100 percent right. Whether it's Mac or PC, um, you know the creative um, uh, creative not studio, but um, 
Creative Cloud mm -hmm. um, is certainly yeah. completely dominant with the artists out there. And um, so definitely agree with that. Right. It, and it's, um, it's, it works hand in hand with CorelDRAW, right? So if you're a CorelDRAW user and you like that vector side of the world, stay there. There's no need to leave or, or force yourself out of it and into Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. It, it's not necessary because you can work with files in Photoshop, save them as PNGs, TIFFs, whatever, Photoshop documents, and bring it in and work with them in Corel, no sweat. You want to pull an image in and add Corel text in it, no problems, piece of cake. So it's just the industry is lives in Photoshop on the full color stuff. And, you know, let's face it, when we're talking about dye sublimation, man, is, which is, happens to be my favorite decorating technique, especially for because of the colors and the vibrancy and the saturation of everything, I think it's awesome. Uh, and most people, when they're in the dye sublimation world and when they're doing their products, they're going to be using obviously artwork and logos and that sort of thing. But a large majority of it is going to be photos. They're going to have somebody's photo of something and we're going to be applying it to a product, right? Or, you know, soft good, hard good, doesn't matter. So what I'll show you today in this class here is um, things that I know will come in handy from day one in your business, right? These I've been teaching for 25 years now uh, at all the ISS and printing sportswear shows, uh, SGIA, Print United, those kind of things, uh, DAC shows. I, I've, I've been the Condi uh, open house several years and, um, and taught some classes there that are very well attended. And, and so I get the questions from the folks, right? That don't understand, maybe they're brand new to Photoshop or brand new to anything in the industry, right? And they have to learn how to manipulate the art. Because when it comes to our industry, there's two styles of artwork that we need to worry about. One is vector art. That's Adobe Illustrator or Corel Draw. I don't care. Whatever one you want to be in, be in it. Use it. No sweat. Uh, and the other one is raster artwork. And that one, I'm going to say, you're going to want to be in Photoshop because Photoshop can do so much more than Corel Photo Paint, for instance, or Photoshop Elements, which is the... the uh, downgraded version of Photoshop, like it's a little brother. It's got a, it's just been gutted. It's got a lot of stuff missing. So uh, in Adobe, I think you can get still for like a photography plan, Photoshop and Lightroom for like 10 bucks a month. So it's reasonable. It's not a crazy, it's not like you have to pay $53 a month like I do for my full creative suite for each seat that I have. So um, it is reasonably cheap to get into and use, but it is where you should be. If you're going to look in, you know, go to a bookstore, right, while they still have bookstores, uh, and you're going to see loads of books on Photoshop. So it's just a, just more proof to the point that that's where the world lives. And you have training videos, um, plus you have your artwork collection, um, and, and you came up with a face mask collection for us that we're working on, on getting that out there. So that artwork is amazing. Yeah, it's fun stuff. So it's coming soon. Um, we have several. In fact, I'll show a little bit of uh, what kind of face mask styles and things that we have the art packs created for. But they're a lot of fun. I figure if we got to wear these things, we may as well have a smile underneath it, you know, uh, and or, or at least create smiles underneath the other people's face masks that'll see yours, right? So, uh, but yeah, we, we I create books. I, I wrote two books years ago. Um, called T-Shirt Artwork Simplified. One was done in Adobe Illustrator in, Corel, in uh, Photoshop, and the other was done in Corel Draw and Corel Photo Paint. And when, we, when I wrote those books, it was basically a synopsis or chapters on different parts of the industry, from screen printing to die sub to whatever, right? DTG, that sort of thing. So what we decided to do a few, uh, last year, I think it was, maybe a year before, we're breaking them up into individually specific books and training videos. It will be a video courses for all the books that I have. Um, and it's basically, here's a book on artwork for vinyl cutting. So everything from your regular vinyl cutting, cricket silhouettes, any of those things, the best practices to get successful um, artwork out of those and print cut situations. So if you have a rolling BN20 or VersaCam and you wanna print it and cut it, there's things you need to do correctly in order to speed the weeding process and that sort of thing. So 
there's lessons of that in that book. And uh, the, the next book we did was artwork for DTG. So if you have a directed garment machine, it's everything you have to do for that technique from one color simple to full color high end, how to pull images off of backgrounds and all sort of things. Uh, and the one that you just showed, David, a little while ago that, that, um, that Doug uh, uh, DeWitt over there, you guys at Condi did help me out with. He printed some samples for me and that sort of thing. We, uh, we went back and forth. It was a lot of fun to create. There it is. Uh, so that is literally the artwork that you would have to do or need to know how to operate and how to work with to get the best prints off your white uh, laser printer, right? The uh, white toner books. Uh, and right now we're working on the video course for that book and side by side on my next one, which is uh, artwork for dye sublimation. So hopefully that one will be ready uh, come fall this year. So we got a lot of stuff and we got another screen print one in the works too. So there's a, we're nonstop, super busy, but we're focused, laser focused on just the art piece of it. This is what you need to do to be successful in whatever your decorating technique is. I've been doing this for probably 30 years now. Um, and we touch every single piece of the industry. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's, and it's, uh, it's needed. We, I hear, I get questions and, and requests all the time, how to do something, how to do this and how to do that. So, uh, that's why, that's what we're doing. Okay. Well, show us. All right, here we go. Let's do it. Let me share my screen here and let's see if we can do that. We'll call this cooking with Dane. How about that? All right, can you guys see my Photoshop there? Uh, I can, yeah. All right, perfect. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show what you need to do to set up your file properly in order to get a good print, right? So I'm just going to go to File. This is the splash screen from Photoshop. Um, I don't do a whole lot with it. I'm just going to go to File New. I usually turn that off, but uh, since it is there by default, I like to leave it on for people that are new to it. So. Um, the most important thing when it comes to raster files, and I hear this a lot, is uh, the customers or people that don't understand what it is or what it takes to manipulate and work with, um, they'll, you know, they'll tell me, well, it's a raster file, so I can't change its size of it. Or it's a raster file and I can't change a color in it like I can if I had a vector file. If I had a vector file, I can scale it infinitely up or down or whatever, no problem, no loss of data, true. But you can scale and manipulate files as raster files in Photoshop. The most important thing is you create it with enough resolution in the beginning to be able to do things. So what I'm going to show you here is how is exactly how we create all of our art files. We start off with a new design. This is how we set it up. This is what we do to start painting from that piece of it. And, um, we have customers that use our graphics to wrap cars, vehicles, right? Uh, we got a guy that prints gym floors, large format banners and whatnot. So there's, you can do it if you do it properly. So here it is. It's, it's not magic. It's not uh, hocus pocus. It's pretty much just the right side of this window that you see here. So uh, what we do is we set up our files at 14 inches by 14 inches. Um, and I do that because that's a big enough for a full front of a shirt or something. Uh, and the next thing here is resolution is at 300 pixels per inch. And that is a high resolution file, which means I can take this file and I can blow it up because um, the interpolation and rip software and things on large format printers and all this sort of stuff, uh, they're really good at what they do. And they're even better if you start off with that resolution. So 300 pixels per inch at that size, there's nothing you can't print. Um, my, my color mode is I always, always, always create my artwork in RGB color. Even though I'm going to print it to a CMYK die sub machine, maybe, or a CMYK DTG printer or whatever it might be, the artwork itself, I want to look as good as it can look. I want it to be the best it can be. And what that means is uh, as RGB color, and I'm setting this thing up in Photoshop, the best my artwork is going to look is right here. You can't see it, but my monitor is light, right? That's the RGB light spectrum that's going straight into my eyes. It's not bouncing off. It's not printed on something and then reflecting back. It's literally the best it's going to look right here on my screen. So RGB color allows me to get the most saturated colors and super hot, you know, greens and oranges and things that you can't really print. But the cool thing is 
all the rip manufacturers out there, I'll say all, most of them, DTG, die sublimation, large format printers, they want you to feed it a, an RGB file, like a, just a high res PNG uh, file. And what it does is it will take that file and interpolate the numeric values, the algorithms, the colors, and print it out as close to that original as possible. Sometimes if you send a CMYK file, it, it might not even accept it or your colors are gonna get wonky. So if you created an RGB, I say leave it there the whole way unless you have to or you're forced to change it somewhere down the line. Um, now your background contents, this is gonna default to white. So if you're in Photoshop for the first time and you take a look, you wanna come down here to transparent. And the reason you do is because what makes a good product typically is, or good shirt even, um, and mugs and things like that, is if you have uh, images that go in and out of itself, like fluid edges, right? It's not squares. If I'm going to print a t-shirt, let's say, uh, I'm going to sublimate a shirt. If I want to print an image and it has a squared edge or an oval, super clean edge, that's not going to sell well. No one wants to wear that. So they want an open edge thing. They just want it to free flow here and there. You know, mouse pads, things like that, that's different. It's a confined area, so you kind of want to cover that whole basis. The face mask, same thing you want to cover. So I'll show you those uh, as we go. But, um, but, but create your artwork with a transparent background. Now we don't have to remove the art off of a color or uh, of, a, of a color background. So a lot of times you'll get a, you know, an image from somebody and it's a JPEG file and it's on a white background. So you got to take the artwork off that background put on a transparent background and then start working with it from there. But if you just use this transparent um, background contents here and you're ready to go. Now, Photoshop um, will have this thing, advanced options twirled in. And I'm gonna go there for a minute because I really think that this is important. It's at least important enough for you to test if you're working on something, right? So I'm gonna come here and my color profile uh, is typically gonna be set to sRGB. That's a standard kind of a low ball, smaller RGB spectrum. Um, but what I like to use is Adobe RGB 1998. To me, when I'm printing my sublimated products, my blacks are richer, my colors are more saturated using this profile. Now you may have to choose a profile for a printer or cert, you know, whatever certain uh, machinery and equipment that you're printing with, even if it's a DTG, that sort of thing. Uh, and you can do that, but you might wanna just try it. Yeah. It won't hey, hurt anything, Dane. we'll see what the difference is. Dane, print uh, one so with Adobe RGB and then print another one out with whatever specific yeah. uh, uh, Dane, color Dane. profile that they want you to use. And then I think, um, see, check for yourself, but I know that my colors look better using this. That's why I wanted to point that out. Hey, and Dane, that's it. So um, my Dane. pixel ratio is uh, stated square. I'm going to hit create. And what we'll do is we get this window. Now this window is transparent pixels, right? So anytime you see I'm going to zoom in a little bit. These gray and white little squares, that grid pattern, that is a universal representation of transparent pixels from all software. Corel Photo Paint, GIMP software, free stuff on the internet. Uh, anything that shows transparency will show it this way. So uh, knowing that, I'm just going to kind of scroll over here a little bit. And um, I'm going to give like a two-minute outline of Photoshop's interface. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, because I like to get to the good stuff, right, more quickly. And the reason I do is because uh, the way I'm going to show you these things, it is a, uh, to me, it's a, a recipe, right? Uh, when you do these things and you do, you do these steps in this order every time, um, it becomes a habit. So it's very quick to learn and it'll stick with you. You can have a little cheat sheet next to you, that sort of thing. Uh, but what is, what's going to happen is you're going to find that your work is, gets done faster and everything you do looks way better, right? So um, I'm going to spend a couple minutes here. So here's my interface. On the left-hand side, these are the tools that Photoshop allows you to, to use. Uh, and again, I usually turn off these little videos, right? But you can see um, if you've never seen what a tool does before, just kind of mouse over it. And it's going to sort of show you that little couple second video. Um, but what I want you to look at is when I click the, the mouse, I want you to watch this options bar across the top. That changes. So every tool is different. And you notice it changes here. And just watch that options bar. You can see. So the tool that I select is controlled by those things across the top of my screen. And uh, knowing that, it allows me, I can pick a tool, go up there, make some adjustments, and start working. So 
Um, another thing about the toolbar on the left is if you, if you notice this little white triangle in the bottom right corner, if I click on that, there's other tools nested underneath it, right? So that eyedropper tool sits at the top, but there's a lot of other things in there. 3D color sampler tools, you know, note tool. Um, I'm gonna click on this one, this is a magic wand tool, right? So if I click on it, the quick selection tool is up at the top. That's a cool tool, we'll, we'll use some of that here today. So just so you know, if you see a little white triangle, click on it and you'll see spot healing, brush healing, brush content aware, red eye tool, those kind of things. They're all nested together. Um, now, next thing I'll, I'll show you is I have my color swatches, uh, my color wheel open, and you can change that um, to RGB sliders, HSB. You can do a hue, you know, brightness cube, do like that. I like uh, my color wheel. That's just a personal preference, but just click up this little flyout menu and pick the one that you want to work with. Because I got any hue I want on this outer ring, and I got my saturation levels inside this triangle here so it's just kind of what i like to use i leave my layers and my channels open all at all times because i go to it and i use it quite a bit so um one other thing i want to show you I'm, I, I'm gonna go to the image menu come down to adjustments this window i like to call this photoshop's corvette engine right we just opened up the hood on some massive power so you'll notice the stuff that we're going to do today we're going to go back to this menu an awful lot and it's, this is the one thing I want to clear up or just put out there before we really get into it is Photoshop is a huge, complex, complicated, hairy, scary program, right? This is my home studio. So anything that you see back here, the size of this room's got 12 foot ceilings. It's a big room. We're going to literally use this much of Photoshop's capabilities, just a small amount for our industry, right? This thing will do 3D and it does video and all kinds of crazy stuff. We don't need any of that for sublimating <clears throat> or DTG printing or screen print or anything. So, so just put that in your head that all you have to focus on is a small piece of this awesome software. And that's going to kind of alleviate some of the anxiety because this, it's amazing as people get really stressed out and intimidated by it. And there's no need to, because we're not going to use it all. And we don't have to learn everything in it and that sort of thing. So, uh, that's the Corvette engine and you're going to see, um, how often we refer back to this. So uh, knowing that, um, what I will do is one quick thing here. I'm gonna grab this lasso tool, right? And I got one layer here. I'm just gonna kind of do this, right? And here's my foreground color and background colors here at the bottom of my screen. If I double click that, I can choose a color. I hit okay. Now I can go to the edit menu and I can fill it and fill it with the foreground color. Or if I hit the, uh, the option delete on my Mac, or alt backspace on your PC, you can fill any selected area with the foreground color. So I just wanted to do that. So now I'm gonna go back to my layers and this is part of my, still part of my two minute uh, rundown here. I'm gonna create a new layer and now I'm gonna click and hold. Uh, actually, I'm gonna come up here. Let's just go ahead and get an elliptical tool. And I'll just drag, do like this. And I'm gonna choose a different color, like go to my color uh, wheel here, get a blue. It's a nice rich blue. My, new, my second layer is selected there. So option delete or alt backspace again on your PC and command D or control D just deselected that or I can go to the select menu and deselect. Anything in these menus, if you see these number, these letters in the control keys or command keys on the side here, on the right hand side of that menu, this deselect, that's a command sign D from my Mac or control D on your PC. Um, that's a shift command to reselect it. But so anytime you see those, those are shortcuts. The more often you learn how to use those shortcuts, the faster your art is gonna get. So the, all I wanted to do here is I'm gonna show you this. We just created this blue oval shape above this uh, red amoeba shape. So if I wanted to bring the red to the front, all I have to do is click on my red layer here and just drag it up and let it go. So now my, my blue oval is underneath the red. And if I go to the top tool here, this little arrow tool, that's the move tool. If I hit the V key, and if you notice there's a shortcut, it shows you right there in that, win that menu. It says uh, move tool and it's got parentheses with a V. That's your keyboard shortcut to get to it. So you can do that. And then when I start moving it around, I can move it anywhere as I want. So this is the reason I like layers, right? So I can have an image, I can have artwork, I can have text, I can have all kinds of different things on its own layer and I can move them around as I work on my layout, my composition. So I can make it look good and do anything I wanna do 
like that individual layers. It's just a better way to work. So uh, this is the kind of stuff you're going to want to do quite a bit of. So knowing that, that's my two minute. This is how Photoshop works. Now let's get to the cool stuff. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to go ahead and open up a file here. And on my desktop, we got a Condi Live. Let's go to file optimizing. This is um, kind of my favorite thing to show, especially when I have a room full of people, because this gets them to go, wow. And I hear the oohs and the ahs and all that cool stuff, which I really like. That's what makes it fun. So for the, for the lack of a better term, that is the Photoshop sexy. This is gonna be some cool stuff here. So here's an image, I opened it up. It looks pretty cool, right? So what you wanna do is you wanna ask yourself, does this look okay? This looks all right. I can tell it's a tiger walking in the grass, no biggie, but it's, you know, kind of lifeless. We're going to make it look a lot better. But if you notice up here, this tag um, in the menu, when it opens, it says tiger walking, it's a TIFF file and it's an RGB file, which is perfect. That's what we want. RGB stuff. Um, if you have an RGB JPEG that someone gives you, or you take a camera photo or something, your, or your phone photo or anything, and if you bring it into Photoshop and it's a JPEG, open it up and immediately go to the file menu, save as, and save it as anything else. Photoshop document, which is .psd, a TIFF file, which is what you see here, or PNG, because if you save it as another format, you won't lose any data. If you're working in or with a JPEG file, every time you open and close that file, pixels get thrown away. You just lose it. It's a lossy compression uh, method, right? That's what the, the JPEG does. It crunches it down so it makes it a small size. That's why it's the most popular file format in the world because it's full color, but it's a small uh, weight, right? Like it's not very big. This image is 15 megabytes, but it's, you know, let's take an image adjustments here and let's take a look at the, uh, I mean, image uh, size. Let's take a look. We have 300 pixels per inch. This image is like nine and a quarter by almost six and a half inches. So standard photo, high resolution. So this is what we're gonna do. It's a TIFF file. This is what's called, I call, file optimizing, right? This is the most important thing I can teach you. Knowing how to optimize an image um, is going to show you the biggest bang and the biggest results for your customers. Uh, and when you can wow your customers, your customers are going to come back. They do it every time. So here, here we go. I'm going to go to my image menu. And I'm going to come down to adjustments. So we just opened up that Corvette engine hood here. And what I want to do is I want to go to selective color. So I'll get this window, right? I'm just gonna kind of pull it over here and get it mostly out of the way. I wanna see the main image. So where it says colors here in this drop down, I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna go to neutrals. And in here, I'm gonna punch in threes. I'm gonna hit the tab key. That's gonna go take me to the next box. So I just put a three in all these boxes, these CMYK box, right? So I'm gonna turn on and off the preview and I want you to see what we're doing. We're, we're removing the gray or the neutral material, it's gray matter, it's gray imagery inside, inside of this uh, image, inside of every image, even a rainbow has gray in it. And if you do this, you'll notice the colors get a whole lot cleaner. So this is kind of like cleaning it up first. So what I'm gonna do is in these boxes, there is no magic number, but I'll tell you that uh, normally you're gonna live within three to eight. So watch, let's go ahead and put an eight in these. And now you can take a look, I'll turn on off the preview. See how much of that gray we're taking out? I think that's too much because you got way too dark. So let's go back and um, try a four. So I just put a four in each, turn it on, turn it off, on and off my preview. That looks pretty good. So we took out some, I'm going to hit okay to this, right? So my next step is going to be the hue saturation. So right back to the Corvette engine, I'm going to image menu adjustments and go to hue saturation, or I can hit command U or control U on your PC, pull this window up. So all I'm doing right now, all I'm looking for is this saturation slider. So I'm going to grab this slider and I'm going to start pushing it up. And what I want to do is I want to look at my numbers, but I want to look at my image because that's starting to look way better, right? The tiger to me looks awesome. So we're up at about thir plus 35 on the saturation. But I think when we did that, the grass became oversaturated or too hot. It's, it's, it's kind of fighting with the tiger. I don't want that to happen. So this is what we can do. I can come right here to this little master drop down menu. And if I go to greens, I can reduce the amount of greens or reduce the saturation, sorry. Uh, so if I do like this, and now I can turn on, on, on and off my preview. 
So the tiger is here. That's what we started off with. So he's still, it's still a little brighter. There's some saturation in there, but it's not a lot. Um, I think that it just pushes the green back a little bit. And my tiger looks pretty cool. We're not done with the tiger yet, by the way. So I'm gonna hit okay. Now my third step, it's like a six step process here, right? So image adjustments, brightness and contrast is the next one. So I'll do this. Anytime you see this use legacy, make sure you click on it. Uh, and then just go to the five to the contrast menu and put in a five here in that slider. This is the only time I'm going to give you a number because what I want you to do mostly is make adjustments according to the image that you have. Because I open up this file, the color data in this file is what it is. If I open up another photo, the color data in that file is going to be totally different. So just giving you numbers is not going to help, right? Because the we went with a plus four with this one. Well, maybe the next one that we open might need a plus eight. So you have to make those judgment calls on the fly individually. Now, it's taken me a while to do these six steps, but when you're working on it at home, you follow that same steps, those same orders, and it's less than one minute's worth of work. So the effort is not time consuming. You can bang them out really quick. So here's a number five, only because I just want a subtle uh, bump in contrast. So I'm gonna turn on and off my preview uh, right here. And if you look somewhere and you just sort of stare at an area, you'll see what's going on here. You see it gets just a small bump in contrast. That's all I'm looking for. I hit okay. My next step is image adjustments and go to my levels, right? And this is going to be the levels. This is the window that I'm going to work with. So what this is, this right here, this is called the histogram. This is the color ramp. That's what this is a visual representation of where the color is in my file. So this particular image, if you notice, the left side here is my shadow side, right? Here's my midtones in the middle, the gray areas, and then here's my highlights or the white. And you can just see according to that grayscale bar. So this image has more three quarter tones uh, and midtones than anything. But what I wanna do is I wanna set a black point and I wanna set a white point. So we're gonna squeeze the color data together. So let's do it. I'm gonna hold the option key or the alt key on your PC. I'm gonna grab the black triangle. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for black pixels. So I can see maybe just a handful right here. So I ever so slightly move my, uh, my mouse. You can see the black pixels right behind this ear. So we made a black point, we stop it. Now I'm gonna look for a white, uh, some white pixels. So the same thing, hold my option key, click on my triangle. There's no white pixels, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna move them until I see white pixels. I don't need a lot. I just need some nice little chunks of white. And we got it right here in this eyebrow. So what we did basically, for you photographers out there, professional photographers, we just blew out the highlights, right? So if I'm gonna screen print this, print it digitally with white ink on a direct -to garment machine, or if I wanna print it on a sublimate, if I wanna put this on a mug and I want that piece to be white, I want nothing there. Because I can't print white on sublimation, I gotta print everything else. And if I don't blow that highlight out, then it won't be white. If I leave a 2% cyan or gray or black there, then it's gonna look dingy. It's gonna look like a 2% something is in there and it's not bright white. So for what we do here is we blow it out. So uh, I'm gonna hit okay to that. Now the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you my channels. Here's my RGB channel. So if I look at this, there's my blue, my green and my red. And when I turn them all on, it looks like that. I wanna show you this because we're about to do a high end sharpening technique, but it's gonna be pretty simple to do. So I'm just gonna go to image menu now. I'm gonna go to mode and I'm gonna come down to lab color. All right, so nothing changes on screen, but if you notice my channels now, this is a lightness channel. That's the luminosity. That's the detail, the, uh, all the detail in my file. And this A channel and this B channel is where all the color is. So what I can do is I can really crank the sharpness up on this lightness channel and make it look super cool without a touching any color pixels whatsoever. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the filter menu, come down to sharpen, and I'm gonna go to unsharp mask, and I'm gonna crank it up. So right now, last thing I did on it must've been uh, 116, 116% at some point. So what I wanna do is find his head. So let's do that. Cause if you got a face in something, you wanna take a look at his face basically. So I'm gonna crank, crank it up. So we're at about 200 right now, okay? And when I click 223, when I click inside this little square, that's my original. So you can kind of see it there. When I let it go, that's my sharpen piece. So you can see his eyelashes and how much more detail we have, right? Um, it's super cool. I might push it up a little bit more and hit okay. 
So now what I'm going to do is go back image mode, go back to RGB. And there's my, uh, my channels there. So now this guy is done, right? So what I want to do is I'm going to pull up my history palette here for one second. Just put it right over there. So I'm going to go to the file menu. I'm going to come down to revert. So this is an optimized file. So watch what happens when I hit this revert. That's what we started with. So this is what our original was. And that's what we made it go to, right? So as you can see, for less than one minute worth of work, we got a pretty cool looking image here. Um, and if you can, if your customer brings you this and you print that, you got a customer for life. They will always come back. You don't have to tell them that it only took you a minute to create. Just let them, you know, say, hey, look what we did. Look how nice. And what do you think, right? So um, this is my favorite lesson to show because every single thing you do, I'm going to hurry up and run through. I know we, uh, we got a little time here, but we're, uh, we're getting close. So I'm, I got a lot of stuff I want to show you. So I'm going to go to file open. I'll do this. I'm going to do a um, piece of artwork, right? So here is a design that's painted in Photoshop. And you would think if I'm going to paint colors in Photoshop or Painter or Procreate or whatever application you want to create your original artwork in, um, you would think since you're picking the colors and, the, and grabbing, literally picking the pixel color from your wheel or from whatever palette you're working with and painting it, you would think that you would have it, when you finish it, you'd be finished. Like, this is it, looks good. But it doesn't work that way. When you finish with the artwork, even if you create it digitally, um, you want to run these optimizing steps on it. So I don't know if you can see, a, I'm working on a painting in the back that's for my son. When it's done, I'm going to take a picture of it and we're going to mess with it. I would run the optimizing steps on that when it's finished. Whether that's an oil painting, whether it's a pastel, acrylics, uh, watercolor, whatever I do, I always run those same steps on it because it, you'll see what happens. So real quick, um, I'm going to go to image adjustments under the Corvette engine, selective color. I'm going to go to neutrals. And I'm going to go to threes all the way across the board. Take a look. I'm going to try six. Do it again. Way better. I hit OK. Command U, Control U brings up my hue saturation slider. I'm going to kick up my saturation a little bit. I'm not going to go too much because you don't want to flatten it out, but that's way better. I hit OK. Image, adjustments, brightness, and contrast. Remember, hit Use Legacy. Five in the contrast. Hit OK. Uh, next thing, command L, control L will bring up your levels. There's my histogram holding my option key, looking for black pixels. There's no black pixels. So I'm going to go ahead and move it till I see black pixels. There we go. And do the same thing for white. Now looking at this image, there is some white, possibly these little highlights in here. So holding the option key or the alt key, looking for white pixels. There we go. Let me hit OK to that. Change my mode. You can see how much faster this one is since I'm not spending time explaining what I'm working on every sec every piece of it. So there's my lightness channel. Now we go to my uh, filter menu, sharp and unsharp mask. And it remembers what you did last time. So you can leave it there if you want. And just take a look. So here's my original. I let it go. That's my sharpen piece. Looks pretty good. I'll hit OK. Change it back to RGB. And that's what I have now. So if I go to my window here, pull up my history. Uh, I'm going to go to File Menu, Revert. So which one would you want to print? No brainer, right? No brainer. This in sublimation would be sweet, nice and bright. So. Uh, that's the beauty of optimizing. So let's, um, David, I'm just going to keep rolling to you chime in if there's any questions you, or anything you I need to work keep uh, covered. Let you me know. Keep rolling. Other than that. Yep. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about uh, color changing, right? Because hmm, what happened to it? Where'd it go? <laughs> there it is. All right. So one of the things I get a lot, right, is we can't change the color in, in a raster file. So I go to my layers. I have one layer. That's it. One layer. So it's a red biplane. 
So funny thing is we have a biplane that is probably less than a mile away from my house, flies around all the time, but it's blue. So what if we want to make this guy blue? This is how you do it. You go to image menu, come down to adjustments. Remember Corvette engine, we're going to go to hue saturation. Now, last time in our optimizing steps, all we did was went straight to saturation. So now what I want to do is I want to change the hue. So I'm going to just going to grab this slider here and I'm going to start moving it around and seeing what happens. So we can find the hue that we're looking for uh, just by moving that one little slider. There's all the colors in the rainbow. So you can pretty much get pretty close to where you're looking for. And that, just so you know, like, guy that flies around here, that's pretty much the color of his plane. So what we can do, one more thing. This is a monochromatic style image, which means there's a family of blues or reds in it, right? Dark reds, uh, mid-tone reds and, and highlights, um, but there's grays and blacks. So if I wanted to, I can saturate this guy up and make it richer like that. I could desaturate. Like if I go all the way with my saturation slider to the left, taking it out, Minus 100, that means there's no color now. It's just a grayscale, which we don't want to do that. That's boring. So, uh, but the saturation level allows you to get, you know, different levels of saturation on that color so you can find it and fine tune it. Uh, I will show you this piece of it. If it's, if I, I rarely use this though, because sometimes it works, but a lot of times it's too much. So if I need it lighter, I can lighten it up like this and it lightens up the shadow areas. If you notice these stripes here, got a little lighter that looks pretty cool but if I needed to darken it for instance and I go down the same 10 percent um, then this gets muddier it gets everything gets darker so you can use it um, and, so, and it's not bad this works but you just got to be careful of that because sometimes it, it does uh, cause issues so I hit okay now we got a blue plane super easy uh, let's do one other one here one of those All right, we're going to do this one. So here is football. I sure hope we have football this year. So um, with all this pandemic and all this craziness, who knows, right? But I sure hope so. So here we go. We got this helmet is red and blue face mask. This is one of our stock designs. So is that iguana, by the way. So um, that's the style artwork that we create. And if your customer is looking through one of our catalog books or finds the image online and you're looking at it and they say, man, that's a cool helmet. It's one of the new styles or whatnot, but nah, helmet's red. My team's not red and blue. My team's, here you go, David, purple and gold. What? There we go. We need orange and blue. Uh, nah, nah, we don't. All right. So here's how you change these things. We're going to go to the image menu, go to adjustments and go to hue saturation, right? So in this window, what I want, I want to take that red helmet and I want to change it. So if I just go to the hue slider and I start moving things around, look what happens. Everything changes, both my colors. And you might get lucky and you might say, yeah, that's the color I need. Chances are you probably won't though. I'm just saying. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go to my drop down menu and say, hey, Photoshop, focus on reds, right? Go here. And now if I move my hue slider, look what happens. Changes, right? To whatever we might want. Look at that. Boy, that looks pretty good. And uh, now face mask, blue, mm, not what I need. So if I go down to my drop down menu again, I say, hey, that's blue, right? So I come in here, well, there's blues in here. And then there's also cyan. So looking at the color, we may have to do both. We may not. So that's a cyan-y color to me. If that's a word, probably not. It's okay. So I'm going to go to cyan. And now I'm going to make an adjustment by just moving that slider to something like that. Done. Boy, look at that, David. Huh? What do you think? That's too much, Dane. <laughs> That's too much. <laughs> uh, couldn't resist. Couldn't resist. But you get the idea. So you can make adjustments to certain things in Photoshop all day long, right? So we'll do one more on the color here. And uh, if you notice, the first one was monochromatic. I pulled up my slider. I slid it over, made the adjustment globally. The next one, we wanted to change individual colors. So we used the master drop-down menu. And the third one is going to use a selection tool, right? So because, you know, there's basically three different levels of complexity when you want to make an adjustment. So if I come here and I want to change this little guy's uh, uniform from red to something else, um, 
if I pull up my hue saturation slider, change my hue, look what happens. He gets real sick looking, right? That ain't working. So it makes adjustments to everything globally, right? So uh, if I go to my drop down menu and say, hey, Photoshop, I want to change his red uniform. So I go to reds and I do the same thing like we did in the helmet, but look what happens. It still changes other things. Now we're not touching the blue in the background because we focused in, we're focusing in on reds but there's red in his flesh color, the hair and the ball. So when you start moving those reds around, it affects all the reds in my image, right? So not what we need to do. So what do we have to do? I'm going to cancel out on this. And we have to select this guy, uh, the area, select the uniform itself, tell Photoshop to focus on this. And this is super easy to do. I'm going to come up here and go to my quick selection tool. Now inside of Photoshop, if I use my right square bracket key, I increase the brush size, the left bracket key decreases the brush size. Now I can also go up here and, uh, and do it that way. Hardness, size, hard, hard brush, soft brush, that kind of thing. But I don't like to do it that way. It's much faster to do it this way by just clicking that. Um, and by the way, I didn't, I'm happy. I happen to be working on a Wacom Cintiq and this is a cordless pen. It's right now up in my monitor position, but it's on an arm. I could lay it down and draw and paint. That's how I usually do things. So it's much easier if you do use one of these. You can get a, a little tablet. I had one hanging around here somewhere that I travel with. It's a Wacom Bamboo or, or uh, Intuos tablets. There's different sizes, so little small ones, medium, large ones, and then the Cintiq. So whatever one you would work with or would suit your budget or your, um, your style, I would recommend doing it because it's a, uh, it is a awesome way to do artwork when it comes to computer stuff. All right, so if you notice, I'm just clicking and dragging. I'm gonna zoom in and we wanna grab the reds here. I'm gonna make my brush a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna click and drag in here and it grabbed all the reds. And if you notice, it also grabbed the black outline here. I don't care about that. And I'll tell you why in one second here when I'm finished with that and this, okay. It's not, when I make my adjustment to the color, that being black, it's gonna be black. You're not gonna notice any change to it. But if you notice, the marching ants kind of came around this black line, but we, it captured this orange or this, you know, this other color for the soles of the shoe. If I don't, if I leave it like that, then it will affect that color. So what I'm gonna do is make my brush size a little larger. I don't know if you can see this, but right now in the center of that doc, uh, that that uh, brush there is a plus sign. Because this tool, when you click and drag, you don't have to hold this shift key to add to the selections like you do with some other tools in Photoshop. Um, but if you wanted to subtract from a selection, you hold the option or the alt key. And if you can see it, that little plus sign turns into a minus sign. So now I'm gonna come in here and grab this part, right? Because I don't wanna change the color of this uh, shoe right here. So that looks pretty good. Let's just zoom out. I just hit the command zero or control zero, which makes everything fit to my screen. So you can see the marching ants there. Photoshop is, has that selected. So what I could do and what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit command H or control H on your PC. And what that's just going to do is it's going to hide uh, my extras, right? So see this extras here, I can come in here and uncheck it. And then if I come back to the view and go back to extras and do that, it's still selected, it's just hiding the marching ants. Hmm. And I just do that um, in, in, in Photoshop as a quick key. So um, it's still selected. So now if I bring up my hue saturation, I can tell Photoshop, hey, let's go ahead and um, change that color now and find whatever color my team is, right? So let's say my team is green. So I'm gonna find a green, that looks pretty good as a green, then it goes into teal, right? So it's, I don't have a very big green window but this is how you work with it, right? So you find the green that you like, that looks good. It's a good green. But if my team happens to be like a forest green, Kelly green, something darker, that's when I would go down to the lightness slider. And as long as we have Photoshop focused in on just the color, we can make that darker without affecting anything. So watch, I'm gonna grab my lightness slider here and I'm gonna go darker with it to get the proper color I'm looking for. So, that's how you adjust colors in Photoshop and I optimize things in Photoshop. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll hit okay to that. Um, if I do this, you see my marching ants are still there. So now if I go to my select menu, I can be selected here, right? So um, that's that. Couple other things I'd like to do. We got 10 minutes. I'm, Dave, we got any time for questions or any questions came in? Um, keep going. Um, 
and um, I've relayed what I think are the answers to many of the questions to okay. um, to Sprite to uh, put out there. Um, but I'm sure she'll let me know what questions I, I didn't do such a good job on. <laughs> no worries. All right. Sounds good. I'm going to just keep rolling until you say when. All right. Gotcha. All right. So um, let's do a couple of things. I want to do a, uh, a very common occurrence, right? So I'm going to hit this image and I'm going to go ahead and open it up. And here's a photo. Can you imagine if somebody said, hey, this is my bar, my you know, pub in London. Can you print this on a shirt? Whatever. And your answer would be absolutely not. I don't see anything. If I printed it, it's only going to get worse. Because remember, on screen is the best your artwork is ever going to look because it's the RGB light going straight into your eyeballs. So there's ways to fix this if you have to. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to image menu, adjustments, and we'll go to levels first. So here's my histogram. And if you notice, there's a spike all the way on the white side, which means this is the reason I think that everything's in shadow because we were, when it, the photo was taken, it was, it, we took the, I took the photo of that spot and it was lit up. So put everything else in shadow behind it. Uh, if you look at my black side, this tells me that most of the color in this image is all on the shadow side, right? So the way to fix it though, is grab the mid-tone triangle this time and push it towards the ramp of the color. So if all the color is in, on the left side, the shadow side, if I push this little mid-tone over, look what's going on here. Now all of a sudden, hmm, we got a pretty cool image, right? There's a lot of stuff going on in there. So um, now we hit okay. In this point, I would go ahead and optimize my file and work that, that is the amazing. same steps like that, we did everything else. But we just revealed a boatload of stuff that was hidden. It was in there, but it was hidden. Wow. Yeah, pretty cool, right? Absolutely. I think so. All right. Dane so had a question of, of uh -huh. how, to, how to turn a photo into a sepia. Okay, so let me... Let me think here. Well, there's ways we can do it. Let's just assume that this guy had an eyeball over here on the right hand side. He actually, I was going to show you how to put that in there, but since we're running out of time, we, we don't have it. But I can tell you this, if you want to make this a monochromatic style, sepia tone, blue, purple, doesn't matter. That's the cool thing about Photoshop. This ain't old school. It doesn't have to be sepia only, but this is super easy. So if I go to image menu adjustments, uh, pull up my hue saturation. If you notice when I work with color, I go to my hue saturation first. There's 10 ways to do everything in Photoshop, by the way. Uh, but the way I'm showing you these things, I think is the easiest to remember and always go back to. So see this little colorized button right here? This is probably not the best image to do this with because it's not optimized and he's missing an eyeball kind of sort of thing in the shadow. But watch this colorized button. I click it. Look what happens. What? So wow. I can, it, when you do that, it colorizes your, your image. I can change to whatever color I'm looking for here. I can also change my saturations. I can, over, I can saturate it up. I can desaturate it back. I can get whatever sepia tile, style color you want, but I also got the full rainbow of colors. So to me, um, you can mess around with it. Let's just see if we can do a... Uh, Cool. There you go. See that, David? It could be an Auburn Tiger. It really could. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not totally stuck on LSU Tigers. It's okay. Well, we're, we're lucky. <laughs> we both like Tigers. How about that? <laughs> there you go. All right. So that's the easiest way to do that. Now, here's one more that I think is that comes in kind of handy. Uh, I'm going to do this. So you got a photo, and it's pretty cool because you took it yourself when you was in London or wherever and you got this stupid lamppost in there. Now I could crop it out. That's one thing I could do. And I, if I wanted to, I would uh, grab my crop tool, by the way, and then do like this and just take him out. Right. But then it kind of changes things. Maybe you don't want to do it that way. So what I would do is, whoops, <laughs> I would not do it like I just did it. So let's go ahead and uh, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my lasso tool and I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to trace around it like this. 
and I'm giving Photoshop some space, right? So it's just got some extra room. I can get my clone stamp tool and do it that way, but then you, you risk looking, uh, having repeated patterns, especially in these little shadow, uh, shadows, the shadows of the clouds up there um, that could come into play. But Photoshop has this really cool thing is if you go to the edit menu, come down to fill and you get this. Photoshop is going to default to content aware. So if I leave it there and I hit OK, watch my uh, monitor. Here. I'm going to deselect it and it's gone. So what Photoshop does, we gave it that area around that image or that piece or whatever it was, the lamppost in particular in this instance. And it looks at the area, the pixels around it and uses those to fill it in. And there is no repeatable pattern in this. It's, it's done like by Photoshop. <laughs> so um, pretty cool that stuff. Is, that's awesome. Yeah. You find it works out um, a lot of instances. Sometimes if it's something like way over here on the edge of the photo, it will give you some kind of weird pattern because it's, it's out of space. It doesn't have anything around the outside edge. So other than that, though, it works uh, like a champ. So um, what do you think? Uh, no, I wanted to I wanted to talk about one thing real quick. Um, yeah. And uh, you were you were talking about your input profile, your working space profiles, Adobe RGB ninety eight, and just a caution to folks out there that um, if you have an Epson like a five seventy, if you have a Sawgrass like a a uh, five hundred one thousand, those are out of the box defaulted to expecting sRGB. So you, you really don't have much of a choice. You need to, you need to print to it as sRGB. And so I believe on the, uh, bring up the um, uh, print screen, uh, Dane. So if you got, and get to the color management area. And so see printer manages colors there. And that's how we want it. Um, but I don't believe you can change the printer profile or the output color space. So if you look at document profile, there's Adobe RGB 98. That's going to be incompatible with the default settings for those two printers. And there just isn't a, a way to, to fix that easily on the Sawgrass 501,000. On the Epson, you can dig into the driver and you can tell it what the input profile is going to be. And so on the Epson 570, you can change it. Um, okay. If you've got an older SG400-800 um, and you're using the Condi Spectrafusion, you're going to choose let, let uh, Photoshop manage colors. And it's all going to work out uh, because you're going right. to choose our profile there. And when you choose our profile, um, you're, you're talking directly to the printer. So, um, again, a little bit to, to be concerned about. Also, when you're setting your input profile um, under edit color settings, pull up edit color settings just for a second. So here you've got where you're, these are going to be your default. Um, and your default for RGB is sRGB. So if you look down there where it says profile mismatches, you always want to check those boxes, check all the S when opening. And what that's going to do is Photoshop will get out of idiot mode and it will actually tell you when you're about to do something really bad. But with those boxes unchecked, it won't ever give you an error. Um, and so you need to check those boxes. So, for instance, if you're bringing in an Adobe RGB 98 file, um, it's not going to let you know that it's not sRGB. So, I know this is maybe too much for some people, but my recommendation is you check the darn boxes. My recommendation, unless you're a professional photographer and you're getting really high-end images from a digital camera, Keep it on sRGB, and you just have to grin and bear it. Um, you know, if you're if you want to go into and and make sure your printer is going to match what you're doing here, call us. We can walk you through that. So it, again, you know, it's a little bit more than what most people are expecting, 
but certainly with those boxes checked, um, at least you're going to know when there's a problem. Yeah, it'll give you that warning every time. If you drag an image, like one photo from one file into another, it'll give you that same message as well. Like, hey, the working space is different from this, you know, whatever you're bringing in. You want to convert it or you want to leave it the same. So, uh, but yeah, no, I agree. I'm, I like to break things and that's why I mentioned it because I got, I sometimes would other printers, by the way, not the two specifically that you just mentioned, um, get better results in other ways. But one thing I will tell you, everybody here that I, I bought my first sublimation system from you guys way back when, way, way, way back. And we went, I did have some color issues, like match, matching issues. And when I called your support guys, they were awesome. And they walked me through this sort of piece, this area of uh, the color settings and whatnot, and um, fixed it all up first shot. Yeah. So, so uh, we had a question. You, you have a great team over there. Thank they, you. We had really a question good. about going back to your clock there. So hit cancel for me. Yep. So what is an easy way to take out the, uh, the tree there? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this way. Yep, that's what I thought. So, <laughs> and then you can keep the proportions if you if you brought it in, but that's the that it does work. Um, yeah, you know. But so another person asked, "Is there any way to improve a JPEG?" So I guess that would fall under the unchart mask. So the best way to improve it is to open it up and save it as something else. Photoshop document, TIFF file, whatever, because that way it's going to stay at least at that, that um, level of quality forever. Um, if you open it up and do anything with it and you close it or exit out, it's, it's, you don't have to do a save as. If you just X the window out, pixels are lost. So open a JPEG and save it as a PSD or a TIFF file, for instance, uh, and then run the optimizing steps. You can still run optimizing steps um, on any file if it starts as a JPEG, but you just want to get yourself into a habit of getting out of JPEGs. As you see here, I have a JPEG on my file. So go, this is run a regular over there. raw image that I didn't do anything with. Yeah, go didn't run over there. It's a TIFF file or a PSD, right? Because I wasn't working with it. I just grabbed it literally uh, this right before the class. Run so, over um, there. But that's run the same optimizing steps, all six steps, and you have good stuff. Dane, run over there to image, image size, Resize image one more time. Image size. Yep. So, so, and I'm sure you're saying, see that resample box there. Um, I don't know what your opinion is, but normally I want to keep that unchecked so that, yeah. that, that I'll know if I'm out of resolution. So as you change the size, you only get to do one or the other if you want to maintain proportionality. Once you drop to a ridiculous number, um, you know, you've run out of quality. Now, once you see that you're down, let's say you're down to 55, you can recheck, recheck the resample box and then type in a resolution of 300 and it's going to um, try to resample the box. And I guess it's on automatic now. Um, do you have a suggestion on, on which resampling method to use? Uh, no, not really because everything's every image is different and to me it would it would be dictated by the file itself uh so for instance this one i don't even remember what it was set to we're going to reset it and uh, take a look and see so it's by eight and a half by eight and a half i guess at this point at 300 pixels so um, that's pretty good if i wanted to go to say 12 inches here um it will keep that 300 pixels, right? And I can kind of, it does give you like a little blow up version of your quality at 100%. So you can see what sort of anomalies might take place, but that looks pretty good just to see. So we kept it at 300, it didn't increase, it didn't reduce because that resample was not checked, right? But when you check that thing and I go to 12 now, my, my resolution will drop. And that's what you were kind of showing before. Now it's at 210 resolution and not 300. Anything above 200, um, you're still going to be okay printing on these inkjet printers. So I wouldn't worry or stress too much about it. Um, so it's not that I would have to go to 12 inches and make sure this thing stayed at 300. But you can because you can see the quality right here in this window. Yeah, I tell people, Dane, um, for a hard substrate, we want to be at 200 DPI or more. For a soft substrate, we generally can drop down to 150 and still get good results. 
True. Yeah. I just try to drill the 300 as a main thing in their head because when that customer gives you that one little one inch by inch and a half thing he stole off the internet and he wants you to print it on a shirt or whatever, you know, something big, large plaque or something, um, you're going to have problems because there's not enough resolution there. Gotcha. Um, well, Dane, uh, you, you've, you've done really good. Uh, we thank you. We're going to, I'm sure we'll have you back um, awesome. in the near future for uh, another, another session here. And uh, we do appreciate it. Um, so I know we've got some questions probably that haven't been answered. Somebody asked about a laptop. So if somebody's buying a laptop from scratch, um, do you push them Mac or do you push them PC or it doesn't really matter? So personally, to me, it doesn't matter. I'm a Mac guy, though. I always have been. Um, I have both. I got a Surface Pro sitting right here next to me, but I only use it when I have to. Uh, I'm particularly, I'm a Mac guy, but the, it doesn't matter. The software works exactly the same, either one, except for the alt and the option and, and the, you know, control and command key. So that makes it pretty fluid. So uh so my advice, my advice is no matter what you do, buy something that has lots of RAM. Um, That's to me, yeah. the minimum today is 32 gigabytes. If you don't get 32 gigabytes, then don't. And you, you get the high-end chipset, which is the i7 chipset. Um, make sure it's a solid state drive. Um, and you got a good shot at it, 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 it yep. lasting a long time. Um, you know, above that, um, you know, if you really want to get high-end Windows laptops, get, look for a Xeon processor. Um, you know, Apple's, Apple's moving away from Intel, so... Yeah, um, get their own coming. Uh, they're, they're doing their own processors, and that's going to be a major, major shakeup for software folks that have to port um, their software over to the new processors. Well, Dane, I want to thank you for uh, the time we spent together, and... Uh, Dane, tell us your website. Yeah, so I actually have two. One is uh, Great Dane Graphics. That one's been around forever. That's what is focused on our artwork. Uh, and I have a DaneClement.com site that we're going to just launch recently, and that's going to be focused on training. So, uh, yeah, either one of those, DaneClement.com or Great Dane Graphics, you'll find us. And we're about to roll out um, the, um, his collection, uh, Dane's collection of face mask artwork. Um, I've taken a look at them. Um, they look fabulous. Um, and so they've been, Dane has sized them for our um, small and large masks. So you'll be getting information about those um, in the, you gonna bring up something? Yeah, while you was talking there, why not? So, um, wow. Hold on, that's a wrong, hold on. I'm gonna open up a different one here. So just so you know here, these are, what I did. Cool. Yeah. So got you uh, got the good Fourth of July design there also. Yeah, we can. we got we got a bunch of stuff going. This is a PDF, I guess. I opened up. I didn't realize what I was looking at. I was in Photoshop, so I should have chose the uh, different window. So, folks, the 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 face mask is now an official decorating accessory. So, unfortunately, um, right? You know, I, I I bet some of the ladies, men too, are going to have. You know, they may have a collection of 20 face masks, and depending on where they're doing, what they're doing, they're going to pick the one they like. And right. so, um, uh, so, David, this happens to be one of the templates that we put together for yours, one of your styles here, right? Um, and if you notice, just there's different levels, right? So the live area is the first, is this first box here. This next piece, that's the black outline, right? And then the, the little piece around it on the outside there, that's where we stop the printing because you don't want to print the whole sheet and just waste ink. So we, we have it stepped up that way, but it gives us plenty of room. So when we make that print, we can print it, take the face mask itself and lay it on top of the print and just go, sort of center it, uh, right? Because you, you, you'll be able to see the, uh, the outer edge going you know, beyond the mask itself. So it makes it real quick and easy to align and then you're ready to smash it down. So. Yeah, and please, everybody remember that the current face mask, we have are three layers, polyester on both sides, cotton on the inside, so you can sublimate both sides. You need to do one side at a time. 
You could also okay. use the back side of the mask to put your reorder information if you didn't want to put another image. But hey, why not upsell your client? Um, put, put one design on one side of the other, charge, say, $5 extra. That's cool. That's a great idea. These are, one of, these are some of my favorites. We got all the emojis as well. <laughs> that's, um, that's scary. I wore my uh, gorilla one to Costco on Sunday. And, um, you know, in trying to practice social distancing, the mask uh, <laughs> turned into a problem. Um, all the uh -oh. kids wanted to get a close look at it. <laughs> all right. Well, Dane, thank awesome. you. Uh, anything hey, else you, you want to share before it. we Thanks close? Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dane. You take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.